uh, what I would like to do this afternoon um, is take you through the ways journey and entrepreneurship journey. And, uh, and you know, if people ask me what I do, I am an entrepreneur. I start new startups um, that I think and I hope that will change the world. So, uh, so the ways journey and. Uh, um, Okay, it does work, so this is excellent. Uh, so, um, yeah, a little bit about uh, um, entrepreneurship in general, and, uh, and who in the audience is actually going to be an entrepreneur and build their own startup? Raise your hand. That's impressive, and by the way, the entrepreneurs are the ones that are going to change the world, the ones that are going to make a better world for all of us. And, uh, and I was excited to come over here because many reasons, and one of them is that this is the entrepreneurship week, and uh, um, and I believe that this is, uh, you know, this is maybe key messages and key learnings that I can um, that I can share with you, and hopefully you will do less mistakes or other mistakes, not the one that I did. Um, and then obviously the other part is that uh, they are about uh, 8 million Waze users here in Mexico. <clears throat> and, and you know, and, and, uh, and, and I've, been, uh, I've been to many places and every place tend to believe that their traffic jams are the most severe there are. Uh, and probably you are right. Um, so, uh, so I just uh, had a sense of the traffic jams here um, and it's really bad. So, uh, so hopefully if ways can help you to avoid some of the traffic jams and to save time every day, um, and by the way, we do measure that, and that's quite a lot of, of time that we actually help save people, um, then, um, then this is the biggest reward. The biggest reward of an entrepreneur is that you build something and people are using that and you actually help them. And, uh, um, and if I can do that over and over and over again, um, that will make me a happy person. So, uh, so a start, entrepreneurship in general, you know, it starts with a dream. It starts with uh, you're running into a problem and you decide that this, is, this shouldn't be like that. And, and you decide that you're going to solve that. And you start dreaming about the solution and then you actually developing passion for that. And this is what makes people, this is what makes entrepreneurs tick. And, uh, um, and then just after you realize that you're actually developing the passion for that, there is a willingness to sacrifice. So you understand that in order to go into this journey, you're willing to sacrifice a lot of things, your family time, your other jobs, anything else that you're doing, it's actually, you will not have time for that. And all of you will be into the startup that you are building. And it's a roller coaster, right? It's a roller coaster. Think of the ups and downs and ups and downs. The journey itself has a lot of ups and downs. Um, and it's always longer and harder than you think it is. So if you think this is going to be easy, it's not. If you think it's going to be hard, it's even harder. And, uh, uh, but still, you know, the reason that we are going there, because we dream, because we develop the passion, because we want to change the world and make it a better place, and uh, to a certain extent for an entrepreneur, there is no doubt what's next. It's always, it's always the next startup. In fact, if you will speak with an entrepreneur and ask them, okay, what are you going to do next? They will tell you, we're going to have another startup. And then you will ask them, okay, and this other startup, what this other startup is going to do? They do have an answer for that. So, um, you know, Waze started in 2007 and was acquired by Google in 2013. I left the day after the acquisition in order to start a new startup. But this new startup, I knew from 2009 that this is what I'm going to do next. And the reality is that you run into a problem, you run into an opportunity, you tell yourself, okay, the world is going to be a better place if, if that will be different. And you kind of starting to think about it in the back of your mind, and as soon as you're ready, as soon as you do have the time and efforts and willing to sacrifice, then you go and do this journey again. So, uh, so an entrepreneurship, this is exactly like falling in love, right? So you go into your own idea, you think of your idea, and it takes you a little bit of time to evolve that, and you fall in love with your own idea. And it's the same that you are going into a date, 
And um, you know, there are many ideas or many dates that you go to, and eventually there is one that you fall in love to. And, uh, um, and then it's like uh, you know, you're starting to keep on thinking of this idea and developing your own solution in your own mind, and then you start to share that with your friends, which is exactly like taking your date to meet your friends. And when they tell you that uh, your ideas suck or that she's not for you, then you actually get rid of your friends. And the reality is that you are in love with your own idea. And, and this is what it takes. If you are not in love with your own idea, you're not going to have enough of energy to go through the hardship of the journey. And so to a certain extent, I would say, you know, if you, if you don't love what you're doing, find something else that you do love. Because this is, this is the recipe for a happy life. If you love what you're doing, then you will keep on doing that with love every day. Right? If you don't, you are going to be miserable, and you don't deserve to be miserable. So think about it. Think of something that you love and try to do that. When you start a startup, so uh, earlier we had people saying that they are going to be uh, entrepreneurs. Who is building their own startup right now? Okay, who is in the first year? Excellent. So this is specifically for you, right? So, so think about these key for success in the first year, and the first one will be fundraising, right? So, uh, so ask yourself, do I need to raise funding? Or can I be, become profitable, or maybe I have enough to, uh, to carry me through the period of time? If you need the fundraising, then, then ask yourself, what do I need to show what assets do I need to create in order to raise funds? And then you build the plan to achieve those, and then you go and raise funds. The next thing that is critical is actually the DNA of the company. And in many cases, you know, we start with a mission. We know what we are going to do. We know what's the problem we are going to solve, and we're starting building the solution. So we start with the mission. But at the same time, when we start, we're also starting a company. And this company will have a DNA, will have a business culture, will have a company culture that is up to us to decide on day one what kind of company we would like to have. When we started Waze, we decided that Waze is going to be the best working place we ever had. During the years, during the five years that Waze was independent, about five people left. That's it. People stayed because it was the best working place. And if you build something that the mission is right and the DNA is right, then you're actually enjoying every day that you're there and you know that the cause is right. Um, and this is probably the, best imp the most important thing uh, in order to be successful. Um, maybe the most critical one is the focus. So, you know, we entrepreneurs, they fall in love with their own ideas. They have the tendency to believe that they can do everything, even though that we are not. Uh, but the reality is that in order to be successful, we only need to do one thing right. And so focus is not about what we are doing, it's about getting rid of everything else. So we, the, 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 the hardest decisions is what not to do. It's very easy to say we can do everything, but we can't. We need to do only one thing right. And as I mentioned, it's a long journey. In particular, the one that there is no traction. And I will demonstrate that later with the Waze journey. But there is a period of time that there is initial excitement, and maybe people are writing on you on the paper, and maybe you appear on TV, um, and there is initial traction. But then the product is not good enough. And, um, and it creates lack of traction for a long period of time. And only only if your mission is right and the DNA of the company is right, you would go through that period of time. And imagine that as trying to cross the desert, right? So, so try to imagine that, right? So you're looking at the desert, you are in the middle of the desert, you're looking around you, and it's only sand and sand, right? And you keep on walking the same direction, you walk and walk and walk and walk, and it's still only sand and sand around you. And the reality is that you are very likely to get out of the desert if you would keep on going into the same direction. If you'll start changing your direction, then you might be 
road, going around and around in the middle of the desert, and eventually you will die. As, as a startup, you will die. Um, this turns out to be maybe, maybe one of the key learnings that I had in general in Latin America and in many other countries. Um, what prevents a lot of entrepreneurs of going into this journey is fear of failure. So they're afraid of failing. And the reality is that if you're afraid of failing and because of that you are not doing, you already failed. But the journey itself, the journey itself is actually going from one failure to another failure. You try something, it doesn't work. You try something else, it doesn't work. And you keep on trying until you find something that does work. And then you know that you are actually on the right path. But the realization of the journey is that you have hypotheses, you have assumptions, and you are trying to find whether or not they are right. And this is going from one failure to another failure, from one test to another test, from one try to another try, until you find something that works. By the way, just putting things into perspective, second-time entrepreneurs have five times higher likelihood of being successful. And it doesn't matter if the first time was success or failure. So just keep in mind that we learn so much better from failures than from being successful, that if you go into this journey and fail, just remember one thing, the likelihood of being successful this time, five times higher. Um, one of the best ways to think about big ideas, ask yourself if you are successful, how the market will change. Who is going to be out of market if you are successful? When we started, you know, there were map makers, there were traffic makers, there were navigation ma makers, there were navigation devices. All of them ceased to exist, right? It took us five or six years. And after that, today, you know, there, there are still map makers, but they are much smaller than today than before. Um, nearly no one is trying to build traffic information anymore. Um, navigation apps, nearly nothing. Navigation devices, they disappeared. Yeah, and part of, the, uh, part of the journey of building a startup is that there is a lot of alcohol in the startup. Right? So think about, you know, every time that there is a good reason to celebrate, we'll open a bottle of tequila. And, uh, and there are many reasons to celebrate, in particular in the beginning. So when you launch the product, this is a reason to celebrate. When you hire the first person, this is a reason to celebrate. you deal with, uh, with, with patent infringement or with lawsuit and so forth. Um, you know, the, uh, um, the, the first time that Waze server failed, um, that was actually a major failure. We had an outage of, of many hours and, uh, and, you know, and all the newspaper in many places say that, uh, that Waze is a problem, right? That we don't know how to drive anymore without Waze, and, uh, and if it fails, then this is national disaster. Um, the best thing that you can have is actually people that are using your product telling you thank you. And, and, you know, and this is happens if you're building a product that creates value to users, you will get a lot of those, and this is the biggest reward. So uh, we have a little bit technical difficulties, but sometimes it does work. Um, think of this journey, right? What we are actually looking for is a problem that's worth solving, a problem that, that we would like to solve, that the world is going to be a better place if we will solve that problem. 
And immediately after that, we are looking for the users that actually have this problem, because it's in initially we start with our own problem, usually, and we tend to believe that everyone is like us, so everyone does do have the same problems. But no, other people might have different problems, and, and, and keep in mind that we are excellent sample of one person. This is it, right? So my perception of the problem is not necessarily applied to other people. So the problem, the perception of the problem from many users, and as soon as we find that, we can actually go and build the solution. And this is, this is the, the, the art of the startup, the journey of the startup. We are looking for a problem that's worth solving, the users that actually have that problem, and then we can build a solution to solve that problem. And by the way, I, I've seen many ideas coming to me with a solution that is then looking for a problem, right? So we have built this technology that can do A, B, and, and C. And the first question that I asked them, okay, and who needs A, B, and C? And they don't know. So if you don't know who are your users and, and what problem do you solve to them, go back to the drawing board and ask yourself these questions. So with that, let me go into the waste journey. And, uh, uh, and I would start because this is, this is the magic part of it. And, uh, and this is where, you know, at the beginning, no one believed that it can work. Um, so that was the map of Tel Aviv when we started. That was actually the map of Mexico City when we started here blank page. This is it, right? No maps, no nothing. And when people drove, we collected the GPS from the device, and if we would took this data and draw it out on this piece of paper, it would look like that. And if we take that from a lot of users, it will start to look like that. And this is, you can start to imagine that as a map, right? So if I will tell you that this is a traffic circle there in the middle, it does look like a traffic circle, and it is a traffic circle. And if you look at more dense area, that will be main road versus street. And, uh, and if there is an intersection that no one is making a left turn, then the system can conclude that no left turn is allowed. And, and you know, if there is a road that there are 100 people going into one direction and there is no one else coming the other direction, that will be one way street. And if there is a road that there are 100 people going into one direction, and only five coming the other direction, that turns out to be one way straight in Tel Aviv. <laughs> so the reality is that this is how we drive, and when we launched globally, there were places that we actually need to readjust the algorithm. Now, we created automatically a map out of that, which is not a searchable map, and the street names actually came through map editing tools that we have created and allow people to actually use them and add street names and house numbers and points of interest and other attributes to the map that makes that a map. Now, if someone drives slow, we realize that there is a traffic jam and once we have a lot of users, then all of a sudden we can create a complete map and a complete traffic map where traffic jams are. Now, the important part is that this is done nearly 90% automatically, maybe even more than that. So when you drive, you actually not just, you know, figuring out where traffic jams and how to avoid them, but also helping the rest of the drivers to avoid traffic jams because you reveal to everyone where are you and how fast you are going. And this is enough for the system to extract this information from all the drivers and recreate the map of traffic and then tell people how to avoid traffic jams. Is that really works? Um, so, um, and well, I can tell you that earlier today there was a video here that shows how, uh, um, how the map is being created. And this is, uh, it, it seems like, uh, uh, you know, it seems like a magic because the map is actually created out of a blank page. And, and the map was created in, in a lot of places, yeah, nearly everywhere. So anywhere that people would drive, it will create a map. Yeah, and it took, in some places, about six months for the map to become good enough, yeah, and at least in particular in, in metropolitan areas. And as soon as you become good enough, 
then you're starting to win over competition. So um, you can go later um, into YouTube and look for a uh, search for, uh, for the, this video. It calls, uh, you know, ways map after six months or something like that. But uh, um, unfortunately, it's not played automatically. If you drive someplace that no one drove before, then your avatar will change into a roller steamer and you actually pave the road as you drive. Um, and, and this is, I think, you know, this is, the, so, so Waze is a crowdsource, right? It's being created by the drivers, for the drivers. Um, you know, we, we used to call that, I think it was translated to Spanish into uh, uh, Red Social de Conductores para Conductores. Yeah, and this is what it is, right? So we, the drivers, help the rest of the drivers to avoid traffic chips. There are many crowdsource companies, right? So obviously Wikipedia, right? So, uh, so think of, uh, you know, Wikipedia started 2001, and by 2011, Britannica actually shut down. So it took about 10 years to create enough value that everyone else became irrelevant. So crowdsource in general works in two fashions, right? Only two fashions. One is that the knowledge is accumulative. Wikipedia, for example, uh, or you know, the map and street maps and, and, uh, and uh, um, street names and house number at ways. Uh, the other fashion, which is, for example, how Google works, um, is automatic. So when you search something in Google and then there, there is a list of, of uh, of, uh, of options, you click on one, the algorithm takes that into account and basically tells himself, okay, if someone looks for that, this, this is what they mean. And this is being done automatically, the same as the traffic at ways. So only two options. If your knowledge is accumulative, you can do that. If you are collecting data automatically, you can do that. If you try to create knowledge base that is based on crowdsource, which is real-time data, with active participation, you will never reach critical mass. It's not enough. So Wikipedia Waze, critical thing of the aspect is that you need to trust the data. Now Waze never validated the data. We didn't know if people would provide false information, we wouldn't know. But we have created tools for the people to actually monitor that and basically override information that is inaccurate. But we as a company, we never knew which part of the information is accurate and which part is not. The reality is that if you create the tools, most of the information will be accurate most of the time. Sometimes there will be deviation, um, but in reality, this turns out to be a very, very small fraction. So the Waze journey. Um, It started in 2006, and the one that started it was there with the CTO of Waze, and he actually tried to build something on, um, that will create maps automatically. So as you drive, it will create the maps, and it was running on a PDA. Um, you know, there are some young people in the audience, so I'm not even sure that you know what a PDA is. But a uh, long time ago, just before we had uh, um, you know, smartphones and iPhones, there was a digital device like a, a, a pocket computer that was called PDA, and, and the first version of Waze was running on PDA. And it was only out by himself, and he was trying to do that not even as a startup, but just as a project in Israel. Um, and only in 2007, we decided that we're going to do that. So, okay. So we teamed up, it was Ehud, Amir, and myself, that we decided that this is interesting enough, and in particular, if we take that out of the PDA and put that into the smartphone, then we can generate real-time traffic, and real-time traffic is very interesting, because that would be the first time, and, and you know, I hate traffic jam. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier that I am an entrepreneur, so everyone hates traffic jam. Everyone, there are many things that we hate. But for an entrepreneur, that will be good enough reason to go ahead and say, I can change that. And when you decide that you're going to change that, then you realize that you're going to change that for everyone, not just for yourself. Um, so we build the story, we define the DNA of the company, and then we went uh, fundraising. 
right? And, uh, and we met with the first VC, and they said, no. And then we went to the other VC, and they said, no, and no, and no, and no, and no. And a lot of times I heard no. So two things I've learned. One is that there are a hundred different ways to say no. And I know all of them. Yeah, and the other one, which was very disappointing, is that there were more people telling me no when I went fundraising than girls saying no when I went dating. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's hard. Raising funds is very, very hard. And I will touch base on that at the, towards the end and telling you what do you need to do in order to do that. But, but the most important part of it is that this is very hard, and, it, and it's always hard. Even today, when I go raise funds to a new startup, it's still hard. Um, and it was still running on a PDA, but the roadmap was that we're actually going to, uh, to take that into, uh, um, into, uh, into a smartphone, and, uh, um, and that will create the real-time traffic. And these are the original slides that we, we went fundraising with them, right? So, um, yeah, and the only problem is that the clicker doesn't really work. Okay. So we build navigation, which is mapping and traffic information. We are doing that much faster, much better, up-to-date accuracy at one-tenth of the cost than anyone else in the industry. And at the time, you know, MapMaker, there were companies, there was Navtech that was acquired by Nokia, there was um, uh, Teleatlas that was acquired by TomTom. There were players, significant players in this space, and we basically say, okay, we are actually going to disrupt this market because we have a different way of creating those. And, uh, sorry, where is that? Okay, and, and the smart or, or the, the magic is with the fact that we are actually doing that automatically. So automatic user-generated content. We collect the GPS data from the device as you drive, and you don't have to do anything else except driving. And that creates, you know, for us, that was the magic. For the investors at the beginning, they didn't believe it can work. And, um, you know, if you would go to all of the successful companies, that were start up at the beginning and went fundraising and asked them, how was that at the beginning? Nearly no one believed in them. It was the same with Google, it was the same with Facebook, it was the same with nearly everyone. That people don't believe when you have an innovative approach, when you have a disruption approach. What they do, they go and speak with the experts, right? Now the experts, they know how to make maps, right? They know how to collect traffic and build traffic information. They don't believe that crowdsource can do that. And so, in general, they say, this is impossible. And uh, it's huge reward when people tell you that this is impossible and you just go and prove that it is possible. So that was uh, 2008. We started a company, we called that Link Map at the beginning, and. Um, and we raised $12 million. So eventually, after all the 100 different ways of saying no, I found out how people are saying yes. And, uh, um, um, and we started, um, you know, we built the first version that was running on a smartphone. And, uh, and that was running on a Nokia phone, right? So, so you know, think of the, 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 um, the history line, right? So dinosaurs, PDA, Nokia, and we are here today. Um, and, and it's quite scary, right? So 10 years ago, you know, Nokia was the biggest name in the mobile industry. And they disappeared in less than a decade. And is that possible that companies that we see today will disappear in the next decade? It's more than possible. It's actually going to happen. Now, the only problem is that we don't know whom. If we would, then we will sell short on that. But we don't know who is going to disappear. But there will be disruptive technology. There will be different ways of going into the market. There will be disruptions in the way business is being conducted that will reshape the market. And will some that will not adapt fast enough, they will disappear. Uh, 2009, we finally launched a product and we started in Israel, we launched the product in Israel, and then later on in the US, and towards the end of the year, 
uh, we launched the product globally. And, and essentially, there is ways everywhere because, because everywhere that you drive with the app, it will start creating the map. And if we reach critical mass, then the map will become uh, significant. And, uh, and we brought Noam as the CEO in 2009. I, uh, I was the CEO at the beginning, but I hate to be a CEO. This is, uh, uh, so, so at the beginning, it's excellent, right? So you create the vision, and you recruit the people, and you define the DNA, and you're doing everything. But after maybe the first year, then there is the realization that you need to deal with um, execution and with everything that you need to deal with. And I figure out that I actually hate that. Um, so that was 2009, and then happens 2010. And the reality is that in 2010, nearly nothing worked, right? So, uh, so we launched the application in the US, and it was not good enough. So people will try that, and they would get awkward routes, and they would churn, right? They will not keep on using the application. And that was pretty much the same nearly everywhere. And we had a little bit of success in, uh, uh, in a few places in South America, so in Ecuador and Colombia and Venezuela, and in a few places in Eastern Europe, so in, in Czech Republic and, uh, and in Latvia, and in a few places that we have seen success in that, you know, the, the magic happens. So we have enough users, and, and you know, we, have, we are reaching critical mass of users, and they create better data, and the better data brings more users. But that didn't happen in the US. That didn't happen in Western Europe. That didn't happen um, in, in big countries. And, and everyone was thinking that, OK, this is pretty good solutions for small places, but it doesn't work in large places. And then towards the end of the year, um, Towards the end of the year, um, you know, uh, or actually at the beginning of the year, Google launched their free turn-by-turn -turn navigation. And up until that moment, Waze was the only free turn-by-turn -turn navigation app out there. And everyone told us that we are doomed, that we are going to die. And the, the, the scarier part was that including our own investors, they stopped to believe in us. And, uh, um, and we believed. Right? So we were still in love with the problem we are solving. Uh, we believe that we are addressing something that is completely different, which is, which is commuting, right? going to the work every day and not necessarily navigating or not searching for different places. Uh, and during 2010, you know, we, we were in a position that, so I, I remind you this slide, right? So we were in lack of traction period. And, uh, um, and, and it was frustrating because we hear from the users what doesn't work, and we collect data from the system so we understand that what doesn't work, and we go and fix that, and we release a new version, and it still doesn't work. It's still not good enough. And we did that one iteration after another iteration after another iteration throughout 2010. We did multiple iterations that were focused on let's make that good enough. And every time we were collecting, collecting information, understanding what doesn't work, fixing exactly that, and then just in order to you know, pass this hurdle and face the next one. And that was the journey of 2010 that eventually ended up with, uh, with making it good enough, making it good enough. And we have seen that coming only in 2011. That was actually pretty frustrating, standing here and clicking on this uh, thing, and it doesn't work. So, so that was the idea. Uh, OK, so 2011, we finally got it working. And, and the way that we have actually saw that was that there were more and more and more places that we are reaching critical mass. So if you think of the US, that was metro by metro. So Los Angeles was the first one, and then San Francisco, and then Chicago, and then Atlanta, and then New York, and then Washington, DC, and, and one metro after the other that we have reached critical mass. And all of a sudden, that becomes the preferred driving application uh, from, um, uh, from, so I see a lot of people waving because it's hot. Uh, it's also hot here, so if you want to join me here, I can promise you that this is hot here as well. Um, 
And, and then, so, so we have got the, the, the breakthrough and we have raised additional funds coming from Horizons and Klein and Perkins and, um, and we knew we were going to change the world. This is where we reached 10 million users by that time and, and you know, at the time that was perceived to be the, the benchmark for successful companies. And um, 2012, this is where the magic happened. This is, this is where Waze was growing faster than the entire industry together. So all the navigation apps and navigation devices and anything in this space together, Waze was actually growing faster than all of the industry together. And in 2013, you know, we were growing at about 4 million users a month. And Google came up in the middle of the year and basically put a proposal to acquire us. And, you know, there were a few things that we discussed with them that Waze will remain Waze and still helping drivers to avoid traffic jam. Uh, but eventually, you know, that was a, a pretty quick deal for everyone. And, and Waze was acquired June 2013. And I left the day after, literally the day after the acquisition, I left um, in order to start a new startup. And, um, So, so let, me, uh, let me go into some of the key conclusions. And if you want, they will be the sum of all of my failures. So all of my mistakes are going to be um, in, in a few slides that have um, you know, the most critical tips for entrepreneurs. And if you write them down, if you, uh, if you take a picture of them, and if you would remember to avoid them, then then maybe I helped you just a little bit to build your startup being more successful. So remember the, the journey itself, we're looking for three things, right? The problem that we want to solve, the users that actually have that problem, and then we can build a solution for that. And we are looking for something that works. So we are in the journey of searching for something that works. And every time we try something, and if it doesn't work, then we try something else. And if it doesn't work, then something else, and so forth, until, until we find something that works. And then we're shifting gears and starting to replicate that. And when we replicate that, then you actually run into the same problem, right? So you don't know how to replicate, and you, find, you, you, you think you do. You try something to replicate that, and it doesn't work. You find something else, you try something else, and eventually you find something that replicates that. And so the journey has multi-levels in that sense, that every time you're looking for something that works, as soon as you do, you move to the next step, which is let's replicate that. Something that works. I thought that you're going to bring me something that works. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. You know, if, if people would have told me that I have only one slide, I would be using this one. So, um, So uh, who are your users and what's their perception of the problem? And in many cases, you know, we tend to believe that we understand that. But the real way to find out who the users are is actually speak with them, right? So speak with people around you and ask them if they experience the same problem. And what's their perception of the problem? And how much is that important for them to solve them? And, and then introduce the solution. So speak with the users if you want to get their feedback. Make your mistakes fast. So you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And uh, you know, the, the, um, in most cases, we are trying to build all the product on day one. And, uh, and the reality is that the faster that we will go to the market, it's going to be easier for us to collect feedback. And even if the product is not ready, if, even if the product is embarrassing, is to the level that you would be embarrassed with what you've just released, you should go out there because that's going to increase dramatically the way that you collect feedback from the users. And if you, if you make your mistakes fast, then you can fix them fast. And the reality is that what you do, you, create, you are creating the company as a faster moving than anyone else in the industry. 
So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Make them fast so you can fix them fast. And, and, and remember that the biggest enemy of good enough is perfect. If you try to build something that is perfect, someone else will be just good enough and win the market. The DNA and the mission defines the journey that you're going to have. If you don't build the mission and the DNA right at the beginning, if you don't know what problem you're solving and why, why the world is going to be a better place if you are successful, and if you don't make sure that you build the right team around you, people that are committed to solving this problem, people that, that, can, that can work together, people that enjoy working together, uh, then during the journey, you will have a hard time. You would, see, you would look at your own company and you will tell yourself, this is not what I was dreaming of. So dream of the working place and dream of the better world and make sure that they are building into your mission and into the DNA that you are recruiting. Fall in love with the problem, not the solution. You know, this is what my shirt says. This is maybe the most important one. If you fall in love with the solution, the problem might disappear and you ended up with a solution that is not relevant. Stay focused on the problem. And the reality is that the most successful companies are the ones that actually claim ownership of the problem and not the solution. The solution will change over time. Focus on the problem. Um, focus, we mentioned that. It's not what we are doing, it's what we are not doing. These are the hard choices. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Everything else is not important. And, uh, and don't be afraid to fail. You know, don't be afraid to fail. If you are afraid to fail, then the reality is that you are not trying, and the result is that you already failed. So don't be afraid to fail. Um, okay, fundraising. Um, a couple of months ago, I went into one of the Israeli VCs and sat down in a conference room with, with one of the partners, and I asked them, how long does it take you to decide if you like the entrepreneurs or not? And so he was looking at me and asked me, okay, do you want the real answer or the right answer? And I said, you know, I heard the right answer so many times. For change, I want the real answers. And so he was looking at the door and looking at me, looking again at the door and looking at me, and then he said, before they sit down. What it means is that it takes seconds to have the first impression. And it's the same, right? If you're going to recruit a new employee, it's going to take you seconds to decide if you like the person or not. If you are going in a date, on a date, it's going to take you seconds to decide whether or not you like the date or not. And then you have very few minutes to either let it sink or change your mind. Few minutes, that's it, right? So, so if you are going into a meeting that is going to be an hour, after five minutes, everyone knows if it's relevant or not. And so therefore, you start with the strongest point at the beginning, because maybe you wouldn't even have time to, to, to say what's the strongest point. It could be about the team, could be about the size of the market, could be about uh, your already achieved milestones, could be about anything, but you start with that. This is the strongest point you start at the beginning. Keep in mind that there are users too, right? So if you if you have something and the investor don't think that they will use that, they're not going to invest. 95% of the cases, you, investors do invest in something that they believe they would use. And, uh, and if you cannot explain to them why they would be using that, then try to find someone else that they can link to and will be using that. Uh, learn how to tell a story. So. Um, I, I think I read someplace that uh, one of uh, the biggest fears is, is actually appearing uh, or performing, right? So performing in, for, in front of audience. By the way, if you would ask me, I, every time that I'm behind the stage, I'm asking myself, why am I doing that? Uh, and, and the key reason is that I believe that I have a message to deliver and I'm overcoming my fears of, of being on stage, and in particular this stage, because there is no podium that I can hide behind it 
And, and uh, so it's scary, right? And it's always scary. And you look at the audience, and, and, uh, and in particular, um, you know, you don't even know what they're thinking. Uh, uh, and so it's always scary. Uh, but you have to learn how to tell a story if you want, if you want to deliver your message, because, because we tend to believe that we are rational, but we are not. We are emotional. All those decisions are emotional. Um, uh, based in if we can create a story that have emotional engagement then we can engage the investor then we can engage the, the users then we can engage many people that would use and would actually create some sort of emotions so if I can tell you you know uh, we hate traffic right and 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 we so we encourage emotions right and if we encourage emotions then we not only encouraging usage we also encouraging us you know, people telling other people, and this is critical in order to be successful. So storytelling, if this is a VC, they don't care about anything else that is not a big market. If it's not a big market, then your investors are not going to be venture capitals. They are going to be different investors. But the venture capitals only care about big markets. And then you, you conclude your story with the strongest point at the end. Only five things that you need to say there. So what about me? There is, a, there is a picture of a thinner version of me, um, and I gained a lot of weight in the last uh, couple of years. And, uh, uh, but I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm also guiding a lot of entrepreneurs in Israel, um, and I'm doing only consumer services, so only things that uh, everyone would be using, or hopefully everyone would be using, and only things that create value, that are doing good. So my mission in life is, is doing good and doing well. Um, so it's not that I'm doing that for, uh, uh, as, an, as a non-profit organization. No, I do intend to make a good business out of that. Uh, but the first and the most important thing for me is that I will be able to create a lot of value to a lot of people. And that will be around money and time loss. That will be around... Uh, um, you know, empowering a user that will be around um, um, making things access that are not accessible to the users. It's only about making big impact. In many cases, that's going to be disruptive to the market. So in my, if I'm successful, markets will change. And let me touch upon a few of my startups, so ways we know. Uh, move it. Move it is like ways, but for public transportation. And, uh, and the reality is that it's following the same footsteps of Waze, but faster. And, uh, and now I think that just recently it was announced that this is the, the, uh, the global leader of public transportation app. Um, and, uh, and the reality is that there are more people using public transportation than there are drivers. Um, FIEX, we call that Robin Hood of fees. It deals with the biggest secret in the world financial fees. And in the US, there are $600 billion of financial fees every year, $600 billion. This is, you know, this is more than the entire construction industry. This is more than the entire entertainment industry. And people don't even know that they're paying them. So, so if I will be in the US and ask 100 people how much fees you're paying on your retirement plan, no one would know. If one would know, that's going to be our lucky day. And so FIEX is addressing exactly that problem, telling people how much fees they're paying and how to reduce them dramatically and then allow them to reduce those fees. Um, and we have launched in Israel um, in 2012, and now we are focusing mainly on the U.S. market, and, uh, and it creates an impact. And I can tell you that the uh, financial industry don't like me anymore. Uh, rumor is a marketplace for non-refundable hotel reservation. So think about situation that you make travel plans and then you make hotel reservation and you cancel your travel plans and you get stuck with hotel reservation that you cannot use and this is non-refundable so you cannot cancel that, right? And so rumor is simply a marketplace for that. Go ahead and sell that to someone else and you would recover some of your losses and that someone else is going to, uh, um, to um, you know, probably get an inexpensive hotel night um, and everyone wins, including the hotels. 
So hotels in general are making 30% more up sales from food and beverages and, and internet and whatever, so they would prefer someone to be in the room. Uh, Zeek is a marketplace for store credit. So uh, think about a situation that you buy something and, uh, and you get back home and you see that you don't like it or, or your wife tells you that this color is off a shirt is not for you and you go back to the store and you return that and they give you a store credit. So they don't give you the money back, they give you a store credit that you now need to use. Around the globe, 30% of those store credits are never being used. They expired, they disappeared, they lost, something happens to them and they never being used. These 30% is $100 billion of loss to consumers. So Zeek is simply a marketplace that you can instantly take that and sell that to someone else. Yeah, and it's now operated in Israel and in the UK and it's going to expand country by country. But the idea is that, you know, but the idea in general of a marketplace is that you take underutilized resource and you reutilize that. You allow other people to utilize that. Um, NG, NG deals with the frustrations of going to the mechanic. So if I will be taking my car to the mechanic and they will tell me that I need to replace the carburetor in my car, I would say, okay, go ahead and do that because I wouldn't know, right? I don't know, I don't understand anything about cars. Now, the reality is that they don't make cars with carburetors in the last 20 years or so, but we don't know. When we go to the mechanic, we are helpless. And so NG is an app running on the smartphones, connects to the car computer, doing the diagnostics for us, understanding what's wrong with the car, telling us in a language that we can understand, and then actually asking for mechanics around us to provide us with a quotation. So empowering the users and allowing the users to actually do price comparison. And by the way, if you do price comparison, you will find out that the price varies dramatically. So maybe 50% difference between one proposal from one mechanic to another mechanic and so forth. But today, we cannot compare prices, right? You go to the mechanic, they tell you, leave the car here and we will call you, right? And they call you in the middle of the day and they tell you, okay, uh, we just find out that uh, the carburetor is done right now. Uh, Fairfly, Fairfly deals with the biggest secret in the travel industry, and this is what happened to the airfare after we booked our flight. So in many cases, you know, we compare prices before we make travel arrangements, before we book our flight. And maybe we even monitor them over a period of time and we see that they are going up and down. And at a certain point of time, we make the booking. Now the price keep on going up and down, but we don't check that anymore. So Fairflies checks the price of our own itinerary. And if the price drops, below the cancellation fee, so this is the price, this is cancellation fees, and if the price anywhere here, we are actually leaving money on the table. So it will let us know, you know, right now you're leaving money on the table, one click, rebook the same flight, and get some of your money back. And as you can see, all of them are about consumers, all of them are about doing good to consumers, and all of them are trying to address big problems. Yeah, and I keep on creating new startups, uh, about two or three every year. Um, and hopefully I will keep on doing that uh, and, and you know, eventually solve many, many problems. So with that, let me, uh, let me uh, finish with, uh, with one more story. That it's, it's an old story, so I assume that many of you have heard that, but it's always good to have um, refreshing to that. So, so there was a big conference in in, in, um, in year 2000, and, uh, and a lot of CEOs came to the conference, and the, the presenter was standing uh, behind the podium, so there was a podium, and, uh, and he was taking a glass jar from underneath the podium and putting it on the podium and asked the people whether or not the jar is full. And so everyone said, it's not, and he said, you're right. And then he, from underneath the podium, reached out to a basket full of baseballs and, you know, poured those baseballs in, and there were like three or four of them fitting into the jar, and the rest overflowed. And then he asked if the jar is full, and people say, yes, the jar is full, and said, wait a minute, from underneath the podium, box of M&Ms, 
and he pulls the M&Ms and the M&Ms, you know, fits between the, the baseballs and asks if the jar is full or not. And people say, some of them say it's, it is, and some of them realize that maybe it's not. And, and there was a bucket full of sand, so he pours some sand, and eventually he took the water, and uh, I wouldn't pour the water, but I'll drink a little bit. And eventually he poured the water into the jar and asked if the jar is full or not. And people say, yes, it is. And he said, you're right. So what does it mean? And um, so someone from the audience say that, uh, you know, um, it doesn't matter how full your agenda is. You can always fit one more thing into it. And he said, he looked at him and say, no. The baseball, these big balls, are the most important things in our life. And the M&Ms are the one that provides us with color and taste and everything else. And the sand and the water are the one that will take every available resource that is not being utilized, time, money, everything. Now, if you put them in this order, everything will fit. But if you'll start with the waste timers or with everything else, then these baseballs, these big balls, these big things in your life will not fit into your life. So now go and figure out what are the most important things in your life and make sure that you deal with them first. The rest will follow. Thank you very much.